right. For all of those listening, welcome to the Catalyst podcast number two of five. Today's title is Expanding Beyond Covert Control Agendas. And if you are looking to reclaim your sense of hope and power in a world that feels chaotic and overwhelming, then you're in the right place. My guest today, again, is Christopher McKinley. Welcome, yes. Chris. Hey, what's up, Maya? <laughs> good to be here. It's Thank good. you for the invite. I'm excited to get into this subject matter today. Say that title one more time for me. Expanding Beyond Control. Covert Control Agendas. Covert Control Agendas. Yeah, now last time when we were talking, we were talking about... Um, just general chaos on our planet and all of the different divisive kind of conversations that are happening. And we were talking mm -hmm. about um, seeing the way core values kind of reconnects us to the humanity in ourselves and other people, brings win-win solution opportunities available to us where it's really, really hard to do things that are generative or positive are going to generate a solution if we are angry or if we're overwhelmed or if we're antagonistic to others so you know it's kind of seeing those core values as a, a path out and Absolutely. so okay. that's a great insight that's very helpful go ahead on. I, i'm just kind of excited about the opportunity to help people transmute overwhelm and pain and frustration and shadow some people call it shadow work but to be able mm -hmm. to even alchemically, emotionally, alchemically transmute all of that to power. We talked about I love that. Okay. people who have talked to me and sometimes when I have this too, just kind of feeling powerless. Like there are so mm -hmm. many different agendas in the world and not necessarily apparently in our best interests, right? So let's yeah. start there. Like what control agendas do you see in the world? Wow. Okay, well, I can definitely relate to that sense of powerlessness, and I, and I see that growing sense of meaninglessness and, and nihilism even growing in the world, as we spoke of last episode. As far as covert control agendas, gosh, there's a lot that we could say on that. I, I see it's suffusing uh, mainstream media. Uh, both sides of the political spectrum seem to be caught up in a very dichotomous play where it's got to be this either or very black and white there's no states of gray or nuance yeah. kinds of understandings of the world yeah so right there um in our mainstream you could say that the legacy uh, giants the big media guys have been around for a long time um and i think a lot of people left and right and center can see that that is certainly something that is compromised to at least some degree. Yeah, hearing mm -hmm. you talk about the media brings to mind the political system in general and government, you know, government control. A lot of people are very sure. divided about COVID and whether there were covert agendas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly, yeah, I can see yeah, the on. ways that, I mean, if you're trying to govern an enormous number of people, I can see a certain angle of innocence where at first you're just trying to legislate you're trying to put structures in place you're trying to find ways to make life easier for everyone and include everyone's concerns sure. but that can also be really overwhelming and we also you know for every person that you talk to sometimes there's different interests at hand and that can in itself be overwhelming right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then when I look at things like pharmaceutical company promotions of medicine that is known to create negative side effects, it makes me wonder if there isn't some sort of covert control agenda that they're just more interested in the money than they are other interests. There is a lot of capture of our political system. And you see it in the lobbyists that dominate like eight to one uh, for every congressperson. You have these lobbyists and you have that revolving door situation that goes on where congressmen will go and work for companies that were lobbying them previously and then they come back to congress oftentimes and they're working on behest of that company writing bills not even writing the bills letting the companies write the bills for them and then, then just submitting them under their name how how deep does it go and how deep do we do we want to go on the down the rabbit hole <laughs> uh on that is certainly those corporate capture and you know there's this great quote by thomas Paine, where he said that Quote, that there are men who get their living by war is as shocking as it is true, but it becomes all the more unpardonable 
when those men seek to sow discord amongst nations to further enrich themselves. Oh man, that's and genius. so it's, it's isn't that great? Mm-hmm. So that's been known since our founding that there were, and I think Jackson, Andrew Jackson, said that um, even now, early in our country, uh, moneyed powers are already challenging our government to a trial of strength. So. The, uh, the money power situation has been here since the beginning for us, and we always knew that it was going to be an issue. Uh, nowadays, out of the top 100 corporations, and I, I picked this fact up, gosh, like 20 years ago or more, so it's possibly even worse now, but of the top 100 corporations, the top 51 are corporate, I'm sorry, out of the top 100 economies, the top 51 are corporations, mm-hmm. the bottom 49 are nations. Good heaven, wow. And, yeah, and so uh, there's a term corporatism, um, which I think is an important distinction to make because people often look to blame capitalism and free market systems. Yes, I'm, I'm you know, I can see co- crony capitalism and corrupted capitalism being a problem, and capitalism not being perfect in and of itself, but the free markets do seem to be an equalizer for people, allowing anybody, no matter where you are on the social ladder, to be able to engage in trade and be able to achieve upward mobility and not have to be stuck as a serf or in a caste system or under the rule of some totalitarian dictator. Yes. So so we have those issues. Um, So now, is there an even more covert agenda in, in that corporatism is seeking to gain world domination and is using governments and their armies and their media systems in order to push us in that direction into some kind of one world totalitarian system. I, I do have concerns about that as well. Yeah, I, what you're talking about, I've heard people talking about, I mean, even the food, the control of food. So food in the supermarkets yep. is often full of toxins and things that render us obese. There's a lot of money to be made you know, in, in uh, cancer therapies and other things. That it's funny how these companies or, or these uh, methods of trying to help become so powerful that they become multi billion dollar industries in and of themselves. And then they don't want to they don't want to go anywhere. So telling people to eat less sugar or yes. not to eat margarine or something like that is is counter to the pot, to a profit motive. Yeah, and we've seen in in scientific studies where cutting your salt, cutting your healthy organic fats is actually detrimental to the system rather than positive. It is. But I yeah. think you're, where you're going there, though, and suggesting that food may also be compromised because that compromises our own intelligence, our own energy, our own upward mobility in other ways. Yeah, farmers not being able to grow organic seeds because the seeds have been modified yeah. so that they don't sprout on their own. So yeah. that's part of that whole, you know, is there a covert control agenda around not mm-hmm. only media, not only politics, not only pharma, not only food, but even right down to history at the Roman Empire, conquering a whole field of thought. For example, I think as human beings, we mourn every day a gap between what we can imagine possible and what is real, what's tangible in our day-to-day lives. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you start to realize that change is always going to happen. Loss is always going to happen. We have a capacity to imagine beyond our current experience, that infinite imagination, that infinite desire for more or something new or to explore and expand and play, Mm -hmm. that's always going to be there. So, I think the ancients had all kinds of ways of kind of celebrating the cycles of rise and fall and uh, Mm -hmm. honoring the different forces of nature. And then Rome, of course, under I would believe a control agenda, Mm. wanted to unify nations, or maybe they just wanted to suppress ancient wisdom. I don't know what the actual agenda was, but here, who knows, right? And then Rome conquered the planet and slaughtered so many people Mm. for not conforming. So, Ancient mm-hmm. wisdom practitioners like the Cathars, right? Yes. Genocided. Mm-hmm. Wow. And if you look at the Templars going from temple to temple all across the planet, even as far as India, and looting. And if you look at ancient Eastern temples where there was a, a crystal at the center of a structure called the Lingam and the Yoni structure, and these crystals have been broken, destroyed. 
And so it makes me wonder if this kind of intent to, I see it in, I used to do searching for the patent office and, and there was a lot of conversation seeing patents that should have been still searchable in the patent office that were no longer visible that had to do with free energy or human advancement. Oh, wow. And so, you know, you start to connect the dots and some people say, oh, you've just got a conspiracy, right? But just because you say the word conspiracy does not rule out the truth that all of these facts exist and that all of these For example, the Food and Drug Administration suppression of anything, even when it's scientifically validated, Mm. if it conflicts with pharma interests. Or um, I think of Raymond Royal Rife or experimenters who found solutions and talked about their solutions and started giving their solutions away. Wilhelm Reich is another. And one after the next, the man who built the car that ran on water, there's, you know, they're suicided. Oh, right. Their labs are burned and black suits break in and steal all of their work and all of their notes and all of their equipment. It's just a mountain of evidence of all these things, that's a mountain right. of facts. Yeah, that term conspiracy theory has been turned by uh, the mainstream major media that we've been talking about, turned into a negative buzzword Mm -hmm. so that you will automatically relate whoever is using something that can be associated with conspiracy theory as crazy and that's not worth listening to. But of course, there can be truth. Uh, There are conspiracies that come true and it happens all the time. It's, It's actually a common thing. It just takes a couple or more people working together in secret, which are true and which aren't, we don't know but we can explore openly. And, you know, what you're speaking to there, it also makes me think about, so it it does feel like there's been an effort to depreciate self-sustainability. I Mm -hmm. it goes all the way down to the health and what we eat, but it goes up to now from the individual to the level of the family. The family isn't able to grow food as easily because the seeds are owned by Monsanto and the plants aren't regenerating seeds the way that they genetically modified them. So you can't collect your own seeds. And in places like elite, you know, India, it's illegal to do that. And so they, they get you hooked onto mm-hmm. their seed system like a druggie that's addicted to something that you have to keep going back to the pusher to get more. So you're reliant on the pusher. Mm-hmm. You know, so you see that control. It's all the way down to the level of the individual's health and access to quality foods and quality interactions with those in their environment. And it hits the family. It hits the community. It hits the state. It hits the nation. So it's, it's hitting us on all levels. And, and then you spoke on the Cathars and the Templars and the destruction of ancient knowledge. That really that really uh, lit me up because, we, we, you know, we hear these stories of the murdering of medicine men and, and women, of witches and wizards mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all witch. over the world. And the word witch. For, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. Before the Roman Empire, the word witch actually meant the wise ones. And then the church made it unorthodox, and so anyone who was pagan, which these these terms became negative and implied someone who needed to be destroyed. Yes, yes, then that's exactly what, what happens. And so that ancient knowledge of what different medicines and different plant, you know, plant medicines can do for us was lost. So you know that before pharma patented the formula, aspirin was actually derived from chemicals in willow bark. Did you know that? Willow, that's right. I did know that it came from a bark of a tree. Yeah. So medicine originally was plants, was herbs, was things that we grow in our garden. For example, I love to drink lemon balm tea because it's very calming. It, it's, an, it's called a nervine. And there are herbs like aspirin that just act on the body immediately. And then there are herbs called adaptogens. And adaptogens are fascinating because they literally adapt to your chemistry. So, for example, Uh, things like ashwagandha or blue purim, mm -hmm. uh, if you take them and you don't need them, they don't act on the body. But where you need them, then they act on the body. It's fascinating. Oh, wow. So, okay, so let's just kind of zoom way out and take a way out bird's eye view of this conversation. Control agendas, whether it's a conspiracy or not, is debatable, certainly. But there are places in our daily lives where we have loss, where we don't maybe have the freedoms that we want, where we desire to grow and for whatever reason we get frustrated, or where we don't have the freedom that we want, right? Mm -hmm. 
But if we zoom out even further, the ancients talked about the yugas and the golden ages and the dark ages and the Ouroboros of this cycle that just goes around and around from dark ages to light ages. Yeah, I follow uh, one yuga teacher that, that talks on the stage of Kali Yuga that we are in right now mm-hmm. and how uh, we are hopefully moving into a new golden age. When we spoke of this a little bit last time too, when we spoke of the age of Aquarius. So don't the ancients consider things like preference and change and loss and desire, they consider it illusion, right? That's, you see that a lot, like in, uh, in Buddhism. Everything is uh, samsara, it's, it's an illusion. So tell me more about your, your direct experience with the uh, illusion of suffering. Mm. Well, it's, it's certainly due to attachment, as the Buddhists suggest. To our expectations and our reservations, like mistakes maybe we made in the past, or things that we feel can kind of close us up emotionally that are still there in our psyche, hanging on. So we have reservations and fears attached to them that can come up in our mind as thoughts and worries and concerns. You also have expectations where it's almost like we're putting our happiness, like our, our sense of uh, being okay, you know, into the future. Mm, conditions based off of some kind of condition that we want to achieve mm. and, and it's fine to have i think to have goals but mm. the expectations can weigh on us emotionally because we're expecting it to happen and if you can drop the expecting part and just do the thing that needs to be done and let it go you know you just do it because it's the right thing to do mm-hmm. um this is a goal i would like to achieve but i'm not going to set emotional attachments to this coming true i'm just going to go for it. Yeah. We let, when we let go of that expectation and those reservations, we find that we're more fully present in this moment. So we can actually attend to whatever we need to attend to much more gracefully, much more optimally. And we're much more likely to achieve those things, those goals that we would like to achieve. But the expectation and, and the reservations using up all this extra processing power in the brain. So that's going on all the time. So our impressions of the material reality that we are in at all times are, it's like it's being seen through the filters of our minds thinking, you know, the projection, the projected image that we're putting on the world through our thoughts about it. We're not, so we're not seeing life as it is. And then, I mean, if you want to go into the physics level of it, of course, everything is nothing but energy mm-hmm. and, and vibrating. And what we take in through our five senses is not actually what the world and the universe looks like. It's just the best that our brains can do to come up with a way that is manageable for us to navigate through. So the color red might not actually be red at all. You know, yeah. it's just the way our brain interprets that vibration uh, bit of light. Yeah. That frequency. Yeah. That frequency of light. That's right. So, okay. So if the ancients considered suffering and illusion, it kind of sounds like they're differentiating two kinds of truth. A truth that we experience on the day-to-day basis that we consider reality, whereas you say even physics has shown us that what we perceive is because of the apparatus that's perceiving. It's not actually the reality per se. It's not Mm -hmm. the objective reality. It's just the way we perceive it given the scale, the size and the eyeballs that we have. We don't see, for example, infrared light because our eyeballs are not built for infrared light. And yet there are animals who have eyes that are built to see that frequency and wavelength, and then they see a reality we don't see. Mm, So now I'm hearing two truths, the kind of the truth that we subjectively experience, that we personally experience, and a kind of higher truth, a kind of... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also it's an overarching and it's like a substrate as well as Mm -hmm, it's all around. And we are interpreting it as we take it in through our senses. And I think it was Eckhart Tolle, right, who talks about the power of now that the more you just tune into the present moment, the more these projections and thoughts and illusions fall away, right? That's right. You sense more from the actual experience of now prior to the the brain's interpretation of it, prior to the mind's definitions about it. That's right. You you experience things as they are. And from that perspective, it, it does seem like an ongoing miracle. And the only reliable truth is that we are here now in this moment. Don't know if it's a simulation. Don't know if it's, you know, that the atheist perception of reality or if it's the theist. Um, but you know that you're here and you know that you're now. <laughs> and I think that the further you go into that, though, you can tap into some kind of absolute. 
some kind of experiential sense of oneness with everything and everyone. And you hear these reports from people, be they yoga practitioners or long time meditators or from people that have a near death experience and come back. Yeah. So if this is the illusion, if distractions keep us kind of away from this absolute truth, this other, this second expanded truth. I mean, mm -hmm. and then I can understand the Matrix movie better, right? Because then people who don't right. know better, they pick up these false cultural conditionings and then repeat it and spread it. So we're all repeating these stories about the political system and our frustrations about powerlessness and da da mm. da da. When in fact, I mean, I'm certainly not Buddha or Jesus. I'm not an expert in any of this, but I've definitely had peak experiences where we tap into mm. this sense of, like we were talking earlier about the imagination being infinite, mm. right? Yes. So if I tell you right now, like imagine a perfect circle, mm. you can okay. do that, right? You see okay. it in your mind's yeah. eye. Or if you don't have a kind of visual imagination, maybe you have a sensory imagination and you can feel the sense of a perfect circle. But then when we go to draw it, the physical body reality is very different than that infinite imagination body, right? Mm, yeah, so true. And, you know, and, it's, it's like we're getting to take part in a co-created venture. And I think we miss that if we are stuck in our heads all the time and we're in the past and the future all the time. So I, I'm, I love that we're... we're focusing in on this because that seems to work be where all the magic in our lives happens it's in these present moments it's when you walk outside and you open the door and it's a beautiful day the sun is setting and the wind is soft against your skin and just mm -hmm. takes you away for a second before mm -hmm. you even remark to yourself how beautiful you're just there you're with it your presence everyone's mm -hmm. had these experiences but they're like glimpses and blinks of an eye but i mm -hmm. think it's something that can become increasingly deep you know more more have more depth of experience for us and increasingly available, increasingly consistent to our mm. practice. So nature is one practice then that taps you into that sense of the infinite, that feeling of being one with nature? Absolutely. And that, that's such a great place to meditate too. If you ever have the chance and you're trying to learn how to meditate, sit outside and do it somewhere in nature. Like go find the uh, the local stream or creek or a little spot of woods that you can go and sit in mm -hmm. and just be there with the wind and the trees and the birds and the animals and feeling the moment. Mm -hmm. It seems to be much more easy to tap into when you're outside in nature. Mm -hmm. Kind of expanding your awareness out to the air or out to the sunlight or out to the sounds around you and the birds. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Open it up to it all. And a feeling of one's body as it sits on the ground, wherever it is, or even if you're doing a walking or standing meditation, just the feeling of being and then feel the beingness that stretches out beyond you and feel the beingness of the trees and the plants mm -hmm. and the water and then the wonder of the infinite space around us. Because, you know, we're so used to being on this planet, we forget that we are suspended out here in infinite space amongst all these things that we call stars. Mm -hmm. So we lose that sense of wonder and awe mm -hmm. um, when we're caught up in our minds. And when we come back to the present moment through whichever mindfulness practice, be it Tai Chi or yoga or traditional Buddhist style meditation or even Christian prayer, you can find yourself tapping back into a sense of the sacred. Through and wonder and awe. Yes. Mm. As you're talking about it, and I'm just putting myself there, right? Like people say, go to your happy place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like whether it's a you know oasis island or a beach or going and walking <laughs> through the forest like i can feel yeah. the calming just as i imagine that i love and, how powerful our imaginations are and if you don't have access to nature nearby guys you can create yourself a little ritual table where you picture of jesus or buddha or whatever teacher that that really speaks deeply to you and you can collect some flowers or whatever you'd like and have maybe it's just a special book and some rocks and crystals you collected or whatever it is you create a sacred space for yourself so that you have a, a grounded place you can go and you can you can meditate each day that changes everything yeah well you know i've been talking a little bit tongue-in-cheek because i grew up as an atheist slash agnostic hmm. I got kicked out of church school when I was 12 years old because I kept asking questions about contradictions ah, that I didn't understand. Story. Wow, really. that's awesome. Yeah, oh yeah, very similar. 
And I just, I was seriously, sincerely, innocently just wanting to understand how the dots connected. And they booted my butt out of there. They were like, leave and don't come back. Literally, they told me not to come back. So I was this shocked kid who then became a skeptic. And And so for me, nothing spiritual made sense unless, one, I could experience it directly. Mm. And two, it made sense to my kind of scientific brain, my rational brain, the kind of tangible part of me that wanted to be able to feel the reality of things in this, you know, subjective reality. And so, even when the ancients talk about, you know, feeling the oneness with all things being one, all things are unity, that has not been a part of most of my life until I started to hear about cymatics. I've heard of cymatics. You have to refresh my memory on that. Oh, it's really it sounds fascinating. Sounds like a type of uh, neuro linguistic programming. Is no, that that so it came out of I think the 1950s. Basically, somebody put sand on a metal plate and put a oh, speaker right. underneath it, and yes. then they and would tune. Mm-hmm, they would vibrate mm-hmm. sound underneath the metal plate, and the sands would shift to create geometric patterns on the plate. And a lot of people have heard about this now, and you can find all over the internet 3D cymatic patterns of grains of dust or mud or sand or whatever, baby powder on metal plates and these amazing organic forms that you see in nature, like in a sunflower or that you see in a conch shell or that you see Mm -hmm. in tree leaves or that you see on flower petals. These things show up and it started to make me think, oh, that actually starts to make more sense about how everything is actually interconnected from a rational perspective. Because if everything is vibration, it's kind of like, have you seen noise cancel? images or like they do this with um, sunglasses also polarized sunglasses basically block a particular wavelength and so when you put two of them over top of each other it creates an interference pattern do you know what I'm talking about okay I think I know what you're talking about I can picture it So, noise canceling, basically the way noise canceling works is it puts out a vibration that interacts with the ambient sound vibration and the two waves coming together silence each other. Cancels them. Okay. There's an interference pattern between the two waves, the two vibrations that cancel. And so, this started to really connect me to... A, a tangible, practical spirituality that wasn't dogma, but actually direct experience. Mm, so, yes. one of the things I love doing is when I'm trying to heal a pain, I'll use the expanded, infinite perception of imagination, like we just went to that happy place or that going out into nature in our minds, right? Mm-hmm. So, that's a brainwave, that's a frequency, right? Yeah. So, by using brainwave frequencies to noise cancel pain, I've been able to do deep healing for myself and for clients over the years. Part of what this means, for me anyway, is that if we look at all of nature as just vibe, (laughs) it's Mm -hmm. just vibrational dynamics like whirlpools in a big ocean. Mm. So, some Mm. of space has a planet and some of space doesn't but space isn't actually empty it's full of as you said like energy right there are light Potential. yes there there's light that's x-rays that are going through space light that's going through space there's all kinds of vibrational di- radio waves that are going through space it's not actually empty there's tons of activity even in what we consider empty space have you ever heard of a rogue wave in the ocean yes yeah the- Rogue wave, what happens is two different vibrations in the ocean collide and mm-hmm. they amplify rather than canceling each other out, they amplify each other. Oh, and they oh, am- that's in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Go on, go on. Right, exactly. And they create these enormous, like hundred foot peaks yeah. that the ships can't escape from. Mm-hmm. And so then I started imagining all of existence. So we've got space that has kind of still waters, but where the, there's a planet, that's kind of like a rogue wave or that's kind of like a whirlpool. There's Whoa. energy that's so dense 
that it has spun itself, right? That's what they say the atom subatomic particles are nothing more than spin and vibration. But mm-hmm. that spin bounces off. So we okay. can't put our hand through a wall. Why? Why can't we put our hands through a wall? If atoms are 99% space, why can't we do that? Well, we right. can't do that because the spinning, it's kind of like if you've ever tried to do a belly flop on a, a pool and it hurts really badly. <laughs> yes. Like that water gets solid like glass when your belly hits it, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because the vibrations of the subatomic particles bounce off each other. But then some bond because of electromagnetic forces, positive and negative charges either repel or bond. And now we have not just spinning subatomic energy. Now we have molecules and particles and particles that collide into each other and become sand or dust in space. And there's tons of space dust. And then the space dust collides and now you've got planets and suns, et cetera, et cetera. And so I started to just blew my mind to think of all of existence as an ocean. And we are just whirlpools of vibrational dynamics, coherent patterns of vibrational dynamics in this ocean. That's so trippy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's just mind blowing. That's such a cool perspective. I love it. You broke that down really well too. And so suddenly now we can see that we are not actually separate from each other. I mean, electromagnetically, we have fields that connect mm-hmm. with each other, especially within like an eight foot range. The Heart Math Institute measures our electromagnetic vibrational fields as far as eight feet away. I think that more sensitive instruments could probably measure it much, much further than that. So we think we're separate from someone across the room. We're not. We're not at all. Yes, we're not. And that can be a tangible experience. It might not be one that one can actually intellectually break down and and share very well, but you can have the actual experience, an experiential knowing, you could say, versus intellectual knowing. You can think an experiential knowing of that innate oneness. And you can also also see it in that we are consequence of Earth and Sun. Mm-hmm. We are extensions of this planet. You know, what we ingest becomes part of us. We've been doing that for eons. It's, we've literally sprouted out from this planet and become these animate beings, animate as in animals versus the planted plants that are around us. Like we're made of stardust, we're made of earth dirt, we're made of the we, food we it. eat. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Yes. And so that's the intellectual side of it. And then there is the experiential side of it that one can know through like what you described as peak experiences. That peak experiences for those listening, that that refers to altered states or higher states of consciousness. That's, for instance, when Buddhists speak of enlightenment or nirvana uh, or satori. And Mm -hmm. then that's, Mm -hmm. that's that's a peak state of consciousness. And we see that that is something that's cross cultural. We know it's out there for all of us. And that the interference patterns, gosh, well, how fascinating. I can't put my hand through this table. It's like it, uh, it's repelled like two magnets coming into it and, and, and to meeting one another almost. Exactly. If you have two positive, if you have two magnets and you put the positive to the positive or the negative to the negative, you can use as much force as you want. They're going to want to repel each other at high speed. Yeah. I love reading Walter Russell's work also. He's got a book called The Universal One. And he also talks about pressure, like compression or expansion. And he says, for example, helium, right? Helium is very light. It's not dense. It's light. So it wants to float because Walter Russell says everything rises to its natural pressure zone. Oh, wow. So things that are heavy and compact like iron fall Mm-hmm. And we say that the I, that the center of the Earth is has iron in it, right? Mm-hmm. But things that are etheric, light, not dense, so the whirlpools that are calmer, that are less coherent and dense, they float, and we have space that we actually believe sometimes to be empty. Mm-hmm. So I went wow. from getting kicked out of Bible school. To like starting to have accidental peak experience and accidental transpersonal, there's this branch of psychology called transpersonal psychology where they talk about these expanded or, you know, psychic experiences, telepathy is a transpersonal phenomena. And I didn't believe in any of this stuff until I started experiencing it. And then over the Mm -hmm. years, I started connecting the dots and realizing, 
holy crap, I'd actually been experiencing a lot of it through my life and just didn't realize it because I didn't, I wasn't kind of paying it. I didn't, I didn't think of it that way. I wasn't paying attention to it that way. Mm -hmm. And so then I heard this one Muji, the meditator. I love Muji. Oh, yeah. geez, so do I. When I was not having kind of any, I wasn't having any experience of what is this business about? Oh, you heard the joke about the monks and the hot dogs, right? I'm not sure I had. <laughs> so <laughs> just share it. I got to hear this. Two monks were going for hot dogs. What did one monk say to the other monk? Mm. Make me one with everything. Oh, yes. Okay. Classic. Uh, but I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyway, yes. so I like corny. I like word games. Forgive me. <laughs> so, anyway, I was hearing these things, you know, like we are one, all is love, da da da. And I was not having that direct experience yet. So then I heard a practice that Muji gave called Watching the Watcher. Will you do yes. it with me? Have you heard of it? Oh, uh, yes. Let's do it. I'd love it. <laughs> all right. So the idea is. Just for a moment, watch your thoughts. We're in the beta zone. The thoughts are running. Maybe you're thinking about the call or you're thinking about what you have to do after the call. Or maybe you're thinking about problems in your life that have been rattling around in your head all day. Yeah, yeah. Just watching the thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Notice how you feel as you're watching those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now... Watch the part of you that's watching your thoughts. Ah, uh, yes. Now, I know what happens to me when I do this, but what happened to you when you were watching The Watcher? So, when I'm watching the thoughts, it's like, getting into a detached state, so detached from the emotional weight, of the different thoughts that come up. So there's like a freedom. Yeah. And then when you turn and watch the watcher, it's like trying to turn your own eye in on itself. And there's really nothing there. There's all, nothing all there. Is, there's nothing there. There's just, I guess you could say there's awareness. That's what happened but to me Even that too. awareness, it, yeah. It just got totally silent. It, yeah, that's it. It gets silent. That's it. It reveals that underlying and overriding presence. That substrate and that absolute transcendence at once. And at first, when one practices this, it can feel... Mundane. This is just a moment. But that little trick of self-inquiry that Muji presents there, of turning the awareness in on itself to watch the watcher, is where you find, a, at first perhaps, a subtle but peaceful stillness. I mean, I, from experience, I love Muji, and I, and I, uh, I really take to self-inquiry practice like this. Um, the more one dives into this, the more depth of that sense of presence is cultivated, and it be, it, it can be quite, become quite blissful. That's freeing. exactly what happened to me. It started to get really blissful and really freeing, and then mm. I was like, "Oh, here's <laughs> this experience of just it's always been here." being one and it's it's infinite it's not that the silence yep. had an ending point as if i could sit in that blissful ecstatic silence for an eternity as long as i chose yeah. to just stay there yeah. and that was the first time that i started to get aware of oh there is this inward access to this expanded mm -hmm. self and that's, mm -hmm. you know, today's title is Expanding Beyond. I need to integrate both the inner skeptic, the, the aspect of me that has been atheist, has been uh, agnostic. I need to have answers for that side of me. But also, I have this part of me that has really relished this spiritual discovery process of going one exercise at a time, deeper and deeper into places nobody taught me these existed. 
Like nobody teaches in school that you can actually train yourself to be telepathic or to do remote viewing. But then there are people out there who do. And then there's like reading a book in college by John Lilly, Programming and Reprogramming the Human Biocomputer. Oh, cool. No, I've heard of John Lilly, but I have not heard of that book. Even the title alone got me super excited because what it meant to me was that we have way more control, way more power to access transpersonal. You know, last time we were talking about the Ubermensch, the the becoming the peak of what humanity is capable of becoming. And I was like, do you mean to tell me that there are abilities and aspects of who we most deeply are that have not been taught to us, but that are out there for people who are seeking that? So then I started to collect and I had this whole list of schools and practices and teachers and hundreds and hundreds of things that I had studied. And and then originally that's, I created my coach certification school out of that and was teaching people the wisdom from that. And then I called it Catalyst and then it got simpler and simpler and simpler. And I realized, you know what? They're all doing the same four things, all of them. The first one is they're tapping into what they do want rather than what they don't. So that's the core values that we talked about last time, right? Yes. The second is they're accessing these expanded states in order to leverage the capacity of infinite imagination of vibrational dynamics of the brain's capacity to render brain waves. They're leveraging that. Mm. And there are tons of books on this and recordings. Bert Goldman does quantum jumping where he has you meet a parallel universe version of yourself in your imagination who then gives you answers, gives you solutions. I've actually been able to modify habits just by doing Bert Goldman quantum leap wow. meditations. There's tons of stuff like this. There's actually scientific research backing it. So I've put this on other recordings. I don't want to be redundant, but there was a test with basketball players where imagining free throws helped players perform better, imagining perfect free throws before the game than if they actually went out and practiced them before the game. I've read about this study. Oh, right. wow. Yeah, so the power of visualization. Yeah. And the same Mm -hmm. thing with virtual reality pilots. They found out that for 20 minutes after putting pilots in a VR tank, they couldn't have them fly planes because the brain was responding to their environment as if they were still in the VR. So the brain didn't know the difference. The brain was reacting as if it couldn't differentiate between the VR and and the physical world that it kept responding to VR as if it was real. And we know about placebo effect and people going into knee surgeries. This is another science experiment where they told people up front, some of you are going to get knee surgery, some of you aren't. Some crazy percentage, I forget the number, came out of the placebo group actually having healed knees who did not undergo surgery. Oh my gosh. And so- And there's a personal friend who was bedridden, totally had blood ailments, and wound up healing himself just by committing himself to this. Now, I'm not saying this is the only thing you should do. I mean, Steve Jobs did it and tried to will himself out of having cancer, and the cancer ultimately killed him. So I would like to say this is for informational purposes only. You make sure you see your medical doctor and your legal professionals and get all of your professional consultations that you need to get and use them together. You know, integrating the best of both worlds, I think, is a great solution. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. But if we can shift our mood in the moment when we're feeling terrible into a state of ecstasy without drugs, if we could change and strengthen our future outcomes by what we imagine for 15 minutes right now, like Mm -hmm. those things got me super, super excited. And the more I was getting results personally and with my clients, the more excited I got about it. So I developed this whole series of expand practices. So I'm always, I'm curious to hear more about what exercises you yourself do because right, the more we can collect these expand practices, the more we can help each other to reclaim that inner infinite capacity, that inner experience of, oh, everything is all connected, interconnected. We can reclaim that freedom that comes when we are not believing the illusion, when we are realizing the true self, when we're dropping cultural conditioning and the cultural negative narratives, and when we're connected to that infinite ocean that we most deeply are, 
that incredible freedom. I mean, okay, let me just say one more thing. I know I'm saying a lot of word salad here. <laughs> I'm oh, just going to say one Go more ahead. thing about this. Eventually, mm-hmm. over the years, I came to this conclusion. I decided, you know what? Putting our happiness in conditions. Conditions are always going to change. There are always going to be losses. People die. The world changes. Legislation mm-hmm. changes. If we pin our happiness on our conditions, it's always going to be a painful, fluctuating experience. You're right. But then if I, we're not learning to integrate the shadow sides of ourselves as well. Exactly. That's what this, this podcast series and these four steps and the, what I'm calling Catalyst, that's what it's all about. It's a, a shadow work practice. It's a way of harvesting the wisdom of the ages to get us that freedom that we're all so hungry for. But not just this kind of sit on a rock and bliss out freedom. I'm also talking about applying that freedom in really, really practical ways, using that expanded state to access information that we weren't conscious of otherwise, that's in the co- that's subconscious right. or the s- collective unconscious. Yeah, yeah. Because I think if, you know, even if one can achieve that blissed out state up on the rock on the mountain, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's there and... The Eastern and the Western traditions, that sage comes down from the mountain. Mm-hmm. And to apply it. Mm-hmm. Back with his community, that's right, to apply it, to get into that co creative dance with the whole of reality. Yeah, that's so why. They learn to stabilize themselves in the truth, and then they learn to, and then they come back down from the mountain to radiate, radiate that truth and share it. And most of us can't afford to go away on a mountain to stabilize the truth of the expanded infinite inner self, right? That's right. Or at least I have not chosen to. I've not been willing to. Maybe I absolutely could. I could walk away from my life. I could catch a plane to Tibet. I could go to the highest mountain I could find. But ultimately, I think... Yeah, but not everyone can do that at once on the planet and (laughs) find ways to integrate here together. And so so we take that time every day. One of the practices that I I love to do is Wim Hof breathing. Mm -hmm. We talked about this a little bit last time. This is allowing oneself to just be with the breath and learn how to breathe again. Mm. This practice is really good for clearing inflammation in the body Mm. and releasing a whole bunch of beneficial chemicals. Totally zen afterwards, too, right? Totally zens you out. You feel (laughs) great afterwards. You feel so good. It's actually allowing you to microdose a little bit of the endogenous dimethyltryptamine Exactly. Our bodies yeah. produce. High without yeah. the extrinsic external drugs. Yes. And <laughs> the microdose is just a little bit of extra clarity and vibrance and mm-hmm. joy. And you're not, of course, going to feel like you're drugged out by any means. And yeah, can, that's true of all of these yeah. expand practices. Like you really, mm-hmm. you change your brainwave frequencies from beta into alpha or beta into theta. But it's high, highly beneficial. And then it also sets you up for beautiful meditation because you'll notice it's much easier to sit with the stillness. It's much more easy to identify the, the sense of presence mm-hmm. and stillness behind all things. And you can meditate from there much more effectively, I feel. If you didn't hear the first call, Christopher is uh, one of the co-hosts on Actual Eye podcast. So if you go to twitter.com at actual eye, uh, I is just the one letter I, actual I, uh, or Insta, you can see he, he posts uh, when he's going to do a podcast. So it's uh, at actual I, one letter actual I, I, actual I, and Instagram also. And I'm Maya from Lift Nibbles. You can follow me at Lift Nibbles, like giving yourself a, an uplifting experience. Lift Nibbles on Insta, uh, YouTube, Twitter, on Facebook. And I'm going to be hosting uh, group coaching for people who want to experience more of what we've been talking about in what I'm calling the expand course. So I love that other... you're doing this. And, yeah. and you're so organized. And this is uh, very helpful for people like myself that are all over the place. <laughs> you've done such a good job of, of pulling all of this integral work together. And Well, let's do one more practice, shall we? Oh, I'd love to. Let's, let's do that. Yeah, so we were talking about practical spirituality, and the whole point behind practical spirituality is, you know, to rubber to the road it, not just get the high, but also actually resolve some life issues. You know, we were talking about the noise canceling, or even better than that, to get better and better at clearing, I like to say clearing the mud from the windshield, or Daniel Raphael likes to call it closing tabs on your mind. Ah, ah, Cool. (laughs) That's great. great? 
So the idea is the more and more we resolve issues that have been bugging us, the freer the mind is. And if you're like me and you've done years and years and years of shadow work and years and years of process work, eventually I just came to the conclusion that, you know what, there's no end to shadow work. Because no. when you, you know, first you pull the low hanging fruit and then after a while, there isn't any more low hanging fruit. It's all the gnarly, difficult stuff. And then you start working the gnarly, difficult stuff. And then you yeah. start realizing that, you know, we are all interconnected. And now you're not just healing yourself, you're healing your family tree, you're healing human history, you're, you're even having empathy conversations with Sophia creation herself. Now you're giving healing to the essence of the separation illusion that is creation out of the one nothingness that existed before that first what was before that first vibration. And even oh, in... Okay. Science yeah. and quantum mechanics and physics, they talk about, you know, that big bang, there was vibration that came out of apparent nothingness. There was this infinite mm -hmm. plenum of potential. And I believe that that's what the wisdom traditions mean when they're talking about en sof ur. The en is the dark black nothingness of potential, everything that omnipresent, omnipotent, it's capable of becoming anything. It knows everything because it is everything, that that's the end. And the end sof is that first vibration of, am I? Like that first self-awareness, wow. I think, therefore, I am, right? Mm -hmm. So, that first vibration is like a blip on the radar. And then that blip wow. becomes a duality of curiosity, like, am I? I am. Yeah. Am I? I am. <laughs> and now I don't know if I am. I need an other in order to verify if I am. And then we forget that we are derived from one and we split into an exterior mirror to look back at us and verify, yeah. Yes, you're you're you are you are let me validate you and now we have all of creation tumbling out of this originally nothing black origin that the ancients called sophia the black goddess the mother of all wow. things wow i love the way you're able to link all this together oh. that was brilliantly put and what what a cool that felt like hearing the story of of uh my life in a way like hearing the story of our creation exactly while you're talking there you're talking about how there's no end to the shadow work and i just wanted to, to add to that there's a beautiful yang yang symmetry going on here there's also no cap to enlightenment there's no cap and to enlightenment yeah there's no end to our potential self-realization and that is to say, just like you were saying, tracking through the process of the shadow work and getting closer and closer to the beginning and the source from which we all came, there is no end to our capacity to grow within and co-creatively grow with the entire world. And our sense of self can broaden as we move through this process of, you know, what some call enlightenment or self-realization. Yeah, I've heard we Christian realize we're friends. not the small self. There's this S, capital S, larger sense of self that yeah. we are all happy at once. And so as one goes through the shadow work and is whittling down the illusionary sense of self and those projected walls between us and the outside world. Yes, melting the walls. In, yes, we are enlightening. We're becoming brighter within ourselves and our yeah. sense of, of self continuity starts to grow beyond our own physical body. We start to feel that we truly are this earth and we are at one with these beings around us in ever deeper ways. So that capacity for lovingness that can come through us can come through increasingly. So it's like, don't be scared away from the fact that there's no end to shadow work because that also means that there's no end to enlightenment. And that extra shadow work we're going to be doing as we continue through our own personal shadow work we start to realize we're working with the shadow work of our world and the generations that came before us. Being able to first become aware of an effective process to do shadow work that isn't draining, that's incredibly nourishing, that yes, shadow work can be ugly and the closer and closer you get to your freedom, the more and more stuff comes up that wants to be cared for because other stuff got cared for, so mm -hmm. more comes up that wants to be cared for. 
And then eventually it all starts to just blur into this spaciousness. And that's my passion is myself going through that process and supporting clients to go through that process. And like you and I have talked about before, like we are all walking each other home back to that absolute Mm. truth. And then we get to the absolute truth and then maybe the black void of eternity gets boring after millennia and millennia and millennia. And we say, you know what, let's go back and dive back into the suffering and the misery to play because it's fun to cuddle cats and it's fun to, (laughs) you know, it's fun to roll in the grass and sex is delicious. And, you know, like there's all these delicious parts of being alive and yes, it comes with the flip side, but it also comes with all of this beauty and this capacity to go around and around that carousel again and again and again. Mm, yes. Yes. I was picturing the big bang happening over yeah. and over and over again. We go through this process from millennia, then we dive back in and we're like, let's do this again in a new multiverse yeah. experience. Yeah. So we, the, the divine is constantly in that recursive loop. In, Involution, evolution, right? That's what they say. We evolve to unity and then unity chooses back into creation again, involves itself back into involution. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love how our language mirrors this. (laughs) So we never... We we did a good job (laughs) coming up with our languages because the etymology is ingenious. Humans are... Oh, don't get me going on linguistics. When we go back to ancient linguistics and you see how the original sounds of Hebrew and Sanskrit and the Phoenician language relates back to meaning... It becomes a whole mm-hmm. magic in itself. It's it's really amazing. But that's for another time. It's um, on the hour, and I know you may have a hard stop. We didn't get to our practice. Do you want to continue, or do you want to wrap for today? I got about 15 minutes Okay, left. we can do that. I think that's fine. Yeah. Let's do it. So, um, if we're going to go through expanding for fueling, for problem solution, for, you know, finding any challenge that you have in life and finding a resolution in a really sweet way, there's basically four steps. And I'll walk you through them. You don't have to think about it, but we need to start somewhere. So what is one situation that if you could have it different, something you're unhappy with or frustrated with or something that breaks your heart, give me something we can work on in your life that's real to you. Okay. A loss of the sense of the sacred <sighs> seems to be hurting our world. And we, we've been speaking this whole episode on that sense of the sacred yeah. and how intrinsically valuable so, it is, how integral it is to us as human beings. Yeah, so yeah. feeling that loss of that sense and the reverberations of it increases in nihilism and division is something that we have had. Yeah. And that, that is a concern. Yeah. Um, and that's not a person, you know, like not particularly personal. But it's but important it is, to you. I guess it you is too. You care about it. Yeah, but it yeah. is very. And you said it weighs sure. on you. So let's do tracking on a scale of zero mm-hmm. to 10. If zero was not heavy at all and 10 is super, super heavy, where would you measure this heaviness right now? Mm, right now, I give it a. Mm, right now, I'm feeling pretty good, but. But uh, if I were, say, embroiled in watching a political video or something, it would be anywhere from a 7 north to an 8. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. So you're not at a 7 or 8 right now, obviously. And part of the no, reason... I, I'd say that I'm yeah, at a 4, a four. right now. Good. Yeah. Well, so we'll start at a 4 because that's what's real right now. And when you're doing this practice, sometimes you'll start at a 7 or 8. If you can get down to a 2 by the end of the practice, you're doing excellent. If you can get down to a 0, all the better. But for now, we'll start at four because that's what's real. And a lot of people will start with something that they're really PO'd about. And they'll talk about what they don't like and what's frustrating and what they don't want. You know, we're suffering control agendas. I can't grow my own food. I am, you know, I can't find a place to live. And a bus full of people just came and invaded my town. You know, they'll talk about the things that are frustrating. Mm -hmm. And that is important. We need to feel it to heal it. We've got to bring to conscious awareness what we dislike if we're going to find out what we want and what we care about. And so in your case, Chris, you already said, I care about the sacred. So tell me about that sacred. Like, what is it about connecting to the sacred? What is it about the loss of the sacred that you're hungry for? Well, it causes a sense of domicile in us, within ourselves and in us. 
see that in many people around the world right now, a sense of homelessness and the sense of the sacred feels like home. It's, it's coming back home. So is it something and, like you uh, see people who feel lost and you want to give mm-hmm. them an opportunity to have peace? Yes, I want people to know that this is available for us all. And it's at the root of the myriad crises that we face in our lives personally and as a larger species and the cultural crises that we face. That feels very close to the yeah. root. So yeah. you have a, a, a connection yourself to the things you're yearning for. You're yearning for that peace for everyone. You're, yes, more peace in the world, the, the war, the destruction, the division, all of that ways. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is step one, is coming from the shadow of what we don't want and crystallizing, clarifying the core values of what we do want. And what I'm hearing you say is you want to be able to live a world that's in harmony and you want to be able to have joy for everyone, a place of togetherness, maybe kindness, a place where we actually can find win-win solutions in easy ways where we're celebrating life and enhancing life for ourselves and for Mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. Well said. So just notice in your body shift happens (laughs) shit happens shift happens all the time so just notice in your body any changes that happen when you go from focusing on the war and the destruction to focusing on the things that you're yearning for do you notice any place in your body that Mm -hmm. feels different as you go through those Uh, yeah it automatically feels more optimistic and And because it's coming from a loving orientation where in your body do you feel Like, where does, how does loving and optimism, where does that, what sensations do you have in the body? Where do you locate that? Yeah, it's it's arising in my core, and it feels good around my heart and down into my stomach. And I can at the, at once I can also feel the weight, uh, um, a weight from a shoulder uh, that is leaving because I'm holding all of this concern and I'm saying all these things so long and so that they step into this part of the process of our evolution. So by focusing in on the body, we're going to tune into the sensations and leverage that to deepen this. So notice that weight in your shoulders. What shape, this comes from Eugene Genlin focusing, what shape or color or texture would you give that weight in your shoulders when you imagine the separation Mm. of war and the heaviness? Feels like a rectangular bar across my shoulders, and the first color that came to mind was purple. Excellent, purple, a rectangular bar. Just notice that. Mm-hmm. How big is it? Like bigger than a bread box, smaller than a bread box? It's about the it's the width it's of my about shoulders. The width of your shoulders. And as you tune into that sensation, allow yourself on the exhale to. Breathe out as much as is willing to release from your breath. The purple, the bar. Maybe it'll shift sizes and go bigger or smaller. Maybe it won't shift sizes at all. Just take your time, breathe at your own pace, and allow yourself to release. Lester Levinson's release work through the exhale. Did you notice any changes in the bar as you focused on the shape and the texture and color? I did. It was really interesting because it, I could see it start to disintegrate oh, in my mind. Wow. And what was interesting is during the initial disintegration, there was a chunk on the right shoulder that was still wanting to stick around. But as you continued talking about it, the, the beautiful language you're using was inspiring and I smiled and I just exhaled and it, I, it, it dislodged and wow. it went out the rest disintegrated of and dislodged yeah, just yeah. left mm-hmm. wonderful so now that all happened in the space of just a few breaths too so now let's focus in on the feeling of an imaginary world it's already done people have already rediscovered the sacred the Aquarian golden mm-hmm. age has landed we are here how do you know we're here? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you notice? I see people smiling. We're outside in the sunlight. People are helping each other, giving each other hands. 
Um, people are putting their arms around each other, supporting one another. It's uh, it's beautiful. I, I can I feel the sense of us building something and joyful celebration. Yeah, joyful celebration, smiling, people holding hands. People feel true, <laughs> like their whole eyes are lit up and they're awake and they're they're here. lit up. Yeah. yeah. And how does that feel on your body to see all of this? Well, I just noticed that I went from slouching to something up straight <laughs> <laughs> just now. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I feel much more tuned in and I feel okay. Yeah. I feel okay with reality as uh, it is. And I'm remembering that this is all just part of the process. Uh, so it sounds like you feel more peaceful. You feel lighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you said that you sat upright. Where do you feel that lighter? Where do you locate lighter in your body? Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting thought. I mean, I could I feel like maybe around my head space. I notice my shoulders are definitely lighter. <laughs> and as I'm speaking on it, I can feel a glow, a, a glow in my heart. Oh, well. A glow in your heart. Feels like an increased sense of clarity and the mental awareness, and then an increased sense of lovingness and compassion and understanding yeah. and emotional awareness. Like a lighter headspace, and like your shoulders are lighter. Yeah. Wonderful. So, what we've just done is gone from step one core values to step two the expanded experience that you're feeling now. And there are a lot of different ways to reach this expansion, but now we're going to use it. So I'm going to ask you to just turn up the volume as much as you can on that sensation, that feeling. See even more details of this harmonious, peaceful, sacred world around you. Feel even more the lightness and shine on you and in your smile and everyone's smile. Feel even more the texture of that lightness in your head. And from within this expanded, blissed state, I'm going to ask a question and I want you just to listen for whatever occurs to you. And the question is, what might I do or ask of myself or other people? Toward this world. Mm -hmm. Just love. Just love. So now, if that's what you heard, if that's what showed up on your radar from this intuition space, what does that mean to you? What does just love look like? What do you do in a 10 minute chunk? That is just love today. Hmm. Well, it feels like a clear scene because it's understanding and it's it's not blocking anything. It's all accepting. Oh. And so I'm speaking of like an agape, unconditional sort of love perspective. It it feels like it can see the concern. Mm -hmm. And it can love where they come from, and it can console and be there with and hold. And I can see this. I'm going to be doing a podcast with it tonight, and I can see that this can carry into that. And so the expression that I'm sharing when I do a podcast later today is as a full permission to come from this place. I, I can see attentiveness in how I'm going to prepare myself before I leave the house. Uh -huh. Even as far as down to how I pick up the keys, everything is just feels like it's going to be more mindful now. That's brilliant. What I'm hearing is what you've done is taken this expanded state and asked your intuition what to do. Your intuition said, just love. And when we put that into practical action, I'm hearing you say things like, I'm going to ask myself the next time I feel a struggle or concern to just accept that that's how I'm feeling and to trust that everything's fine. And I'm mm -hmm. going to make a request of myself to prepare from this place before the next podcast. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So here what we've done is we've translated this inner wisdom, this inner guidance that came out of this expanded place into practical steps that you can take today, right now. Something that you can ask of yourself in a particular situation or when confronted with a particular issue. And this is how we bring heaven to earth. This is what I call the 3D, 4D, 5D integration. If 3D is reality as we perceive it, and 5D is this ephemeral, expanded, unity consciousness, peak state place, 4D is the way we use the imagination, the core values, the heart, to bring it down into the 3D as hands of God, if you will, or cells in the body of the all. Beautiful. So I hope that this has inspired you or someone else who's listening to be able to do more of this shadow work, that there's a way that we can use this expanded state. And I invite you, Chris, to do this right now, is to realize that it is your infinite aspect that allowed your imagination to go to that place that felt so sweet and comforting. And that that, those experiences are our bridge to this infinite consciousness aspect of us. And that by doing this day to day, moment to moment, you can do it in as little as three breaths with practice. You can do it in as little as 10 minutes for something that's triggering. I don't always remember to do it, but I'm trying to do it more and more. And as we are doing these more and more, more and more shadow clears, more and more mountains just start to feel like speed bumps. And more and more, we just roll with life easier and easier. And more and more, we start to feel the ocean of this infinite vibrational interconnectedness that we are. And you can breathe that light from the infinite into yourself anytime you want. Energy, fueling, inspiration, support. Some people call it invoking their angels or their guides or their ideals or the invoking the light. Whatever it, however you call it, whatever it looks like for you, there's a way of drawing that in for healing, for problem resolution. Thank you, Chris, for doing this exercise to give just one example of how to do it for problem resolution and lifestyle practice. I really appreciate you. And without this banter, I'm not so good at just like lecturing to a microphone by myself. Thank you for being here. (laughs) Thank you to everyone. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you so much for having me, Maya. This has been instrumental. You've really laid out some really accessible practices for us here, and I really enjoyed the process of going through them. And I see how that last practice we just did is can be something so powerful for anybody, and you can use it to tackle the most, you know, the smallest, seemingly ins- insignificant personal problem, all the way up to the grandest, greatest uh, collective human problems that we're facing that, that I know we're all feeling and reeling from these days. So that is... Yeah. Uh, something that's truly helpful so thank you so much you. for doing doing this catalyst work here and I, I look forward to learning more about your coaching program and everything else that you're doing thank you well i hope everyone will uh tune in again next time oh, beautiful excellent and access more of our higher selves in the process Amen. thank you for your time Sir, I hope you have a wonderful yes. podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to yes, talking. And, uh, tune in if you like. Last time I said, uh, congratulations on your first co- podcast. I meant spaces. Congratulations on oh, your yeah. second spaces and good luck on your yeah. podcast. Yeah. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me to do this. I, I, I uh, am really excited to be taking part. Yay. Until next time. All right, Sean. Love you Thank guys. Thank you, dear heart. Bye, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.